you have your Bibles with you, why don't you turn to the Gospel of John, <clears throat> John chapter 19. <clears throat> If you haven't met Lois's great-granddaughter, you can meet her after the service. She's a cutie. John chapter 19. If you're using a pew Bible, you're going to find it on page 1135. If you have a Bible that's not a pew Bible, you're going to be in Luke chapter, um, John chapter 19, and we're going to begin reading in verse 28. Hear then the word of God. Later, knowing that all was now completed, and so that the scriptures might be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lip. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, as we come to your word this morning, we ask for your help. This is your word. This is your revelation to us so that we might know who you are and how we might serve you. And so as we come, we ask for your help in understanding this, your holy word. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, Andrew did an excellent job in helping us understand the fifth shout, I thirst. And as you take a look at that verse, verse 30 in the Gospel of John, the words read, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, It is finished. <clears throat> But I want you to see the link between the verse that um, Andrew la read last week and shout number five and shout number six. As Andrew explained last week, this was in fulfillment of the scriptures that he said he thirsted. But it was also because he indeed was human and he did physically thirst. And it's interesting that Immediately after he gets this wine vinegar put to his lips, he says, it is finished. In a sense, asking, I have something I need to say, going to say it so that you all can hear it. I'm thirsty. I need uh, something to drink. They wet his lips, and with no longer a parched tongue, he says, it is finished. But when you take a look at that phrase, it is finished, please note that the word it is an important word here. He's not saying, I'm finished. I'm done. I give up. I can't do anything more. In sort of a defeatist kind of way. Rather, he says, it is finished in a rather declarative kind of way. He's declaring that his work is complete. And the words that we use are important. If you were to Google some of the most popular terms in the last year or two, you would find some of the words that are mentioned are words like selfie and YOLO. Do you know what YOLO means? <laughs> you only live once, right? <laughs> you only live once. <clears throat> it sort of gives you a picture of our culture. Our culture is very individualistic. Our culture is very consumerism. Our culture is all about me and what's important to me. And so now you have cameras that take selfies. In fact, you can buy a selfie stick so that if you want to take a group selfie, you can put it on a stick, hold the stick out here and take a selfie with a group of people. <clears throat> well, I would like to submit to you this morning that one of the most important words is not selfie or YOLO. It's this word that we find in this text. It's a Greek word and the pronunciation is T teleste. T teleste is the word for it is finished. We use three words. The Greek uses one word, te teleste. It's a word that's packed with meaning. It's a powerful word. I would suggest it's perhaps the most important word ever uttered in humankind. And so this morning, I want to sort of unpack this word 
because it paints for us some beautiful doctrines, doctrines that I think that we're aware of, doctrines that I think you know very well, but doctrines that are important to remind ourselves of and even to approach in a devotional way. And so we're going to take a look at what does this word T teleste mean and what does it matter? the devotional side of this particular word. How does it impact our lives? <clears throat> we learn from other passages of the Gospels that the word titeleste was a triumphant note that Jesus spoke. It wasn't a whimper. It wasn't a cry of helplessness. It was the cry of a conqueror. It was the cry of our Savior saying, titeleste, the victory has been won. It's also important to note that this is a verb. It's in the perfect tense, and that's significant because it refers to an action that's been completed in the past, but the results continue to the present. It literally means it was finished, and as a result, it's forever done. Or it was finished in the past, and it's still finished in the present, and it will continue to be finished in the future. Or we could say it this way, all has been done that has needed to be done, and nothing more is needed. The goal has been achieved, the task has been completed. When Jesus used the word titeleste, <clears throat> it was a word that was common in the language. It was used in a multiple of context. A carpenter might use the word titeleste. He would be working on a piece of furniture, and after done with the piece of furniture, and after completing all the, the final touches to it, he might show it to a customer, he might show it to his wife, and say, Titeleste, it's complete, it's done. A servant would run to his master after faithfully finishing all the work assigned to him and report to the master, Titeleste, it's done, it's complete. A son, after being sent on a mission by his father, would not return until he could carry out every last detail, but when he was completely done with the task that his father had given to him, he would return to his father with a smile on his face and say, Ti teleste, Dad, I'm finished. I've completed the task. And even as I say that, I'm reminded of Jesus' words. Because Jesus says in John chapter 4, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work the work of my father. A prisoner was often given a certificate of debt that was nailed to his cell door. And the certificate of debt described his crime and the penalty, the debt that he owed that was assessed against him. And when the prisoner had served his time, that note of indictment would have been taken to Something, we, something similar to what we would refer to as a judge. And the judge would write across the debt of indebtedness, T teleste, complete, time served, done, owed no more, more. And the freed person was given this document so that if anybody were ever to question him, how can you be walking around? You committed a crime. He could take out the document with the judge's words, Titeleste. Colossians 2.14 in the New Living Translation says, He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. It's finished. The debt is fully forgiven, paid in full. You never have to pay for it again. And you'd be foolish to try. Now, if you go back to verse 28, the verse that Andrew spoke of last week, it reads, after this, Jesus knowing that all things were now finished. That word finished, Jesus knowing that all things are finished, that's the same word, titeleste. So after Jesus knowing that all things were complete, that all things were finished, he says, it is finished. There are at least four things that were accomplished when Jesus shouted, Titeleste. Let me go through each of those four things. Number one, 
The suffering ordained by God was finished. If you remember, as you read the Gospels, many times Jesus spoke of the work that he was sent to do. Jesus spoke of the work the Father had given him to do, and he even spoke of the hour of trouble that was coming, the hour of his suffering. He spoke of the baptism of his suffering. All those things were ordained by God. None of them happened by chance. Even the evil plans of the Jews to nail him to the cross were a part of God's plan. And so when you go to Acts chapter 2, and Peter is speaking of the Jews nailing him to the cross, he speaks of it as God's deliberate plan. God's predetermined plan that his son would be nailed to the cross because the sufferings of Jesus were ordained by God. But now we've come to the point where the awful storm of God's wrath is over. The darkness has ended. The wages of sin paid in full. The divine holiness and justice has been met. The suffering is complete. T. Teleste. Secondly, the sacrifice was fulfilled. When you go to the Old Testament, what's, what do you remember from the Old Testament? You remember that there were lots of sacrifices. People were sacrificing all kinds of animals in the Old Testament. And you scratch your head and you say, why were people sacri sacrificing animals? It's because God had given them this prescription of sacrifice so that they would have a picture painted for them. And the picture was that they had sinned against God and somebody had to pay the penalty for that sin. And the penalty of that sin had to be paid for with the spilling of blood. Someone had to give their life for the wages of sin is death. And so in the Old Testament you have these sacrifices. The sacrifices were not meant to take away people's sins, but they were to point to the one whom God would send who one day would take away their sins. And that's why the sacrifices had to be repeated year after year after year after year after year. Because they were not efficacious in themselves. They had no power in themselves. But they were to point to something and someone who was coming who did have the power to take away their sins. And so when you come to Le Leviticus chapter 16, you see the annual day of atonement that's described. And the high priest would offer up a bull for himself and then he'd offer up two goats the one goat he would slay and the blood he would take into the inner sanctuary, the Holy Holies, and he would sprinkle it on the atonement cover. And the other goat he would take outside and he would take the goat and place his hand on the head of the goat. And he would confess the sins of the people on the goat. And then they would chase the goat into the wilderness, signifying God was taking away their sin. But the sacrifice of the goat and the sprinkling of the blood on the covering of the, uh, the atonement cover and the laying of the hands on the goat to take away the sins were all picturing that there was one who was going to come and do this. And so when Jesus died, he died as the final and perfect sacrifice. It is finished. No longer any need for sacrifice. No longer any need to put my hands on a goat so a goat can take my sins, as it were, into the wilderness. No more was there a need to sprinkle blood inside the temple curtain. And in fact, when, the temple, when Jesus dies, what happens to the temple curtain? It's torn in two. Why is it torn in two? So that the people would understand that no longer... Only can the high priest go into the Holy of Holies, but you and I can go into the Holy of Holies. Why? Because it's finished. Titeleste. Jesus has paid the final sacrifice. Jesus also is the scapegoat who was crucified outside the camp, outside of Jerusalem, taking the penalty of sins 
to the cross. Leviticus 16, 22 paints the picture of what Jesus did on the cross. Leviticus 16, 22 says this, the goat will carry on itself all their sins to a solitary place. And Jesus did that. He was outside the walls of Jerusalem. And he also, as we studied a few weeks ago, he was for a moment in time abandoned by the Father. He was in a solitary place. And so he cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Hebrews 13, verse 12 says, And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. The work of Jesus is complete. He sits at the right hand of God because it's complete. The sacrificing of the Savior is sufficient. Jesus has completed everything. Titeleste. Thirdly, Satan was defeated. You know, as we've studied through the years, one of the books that we studied was the book of Genesis here on Sunday morning. We went through all of Genesis. And do you remember the key verse of Genesis? The most important verse, I think, in all of Scripture? Genesis 3.15. The promise that from the seed of the woman would come one who would crush the seed of the serpent. And all of biblical history is tied to that verse. Everything that takes place is helping us to understand that God is going to fulfill his promise. That from the seed of the woman would come one who would crush the seed, the head of the serpent. Now, Satan may have thought that the cross was his greatest point of victory. He may have for a moment in time thought, I've got Jesus on the cross. John, 21 tells us some, John 12 tells us something different. Verse 31 of chapter 12. Now is the time of judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world has been driven out. Hebrews 2.14 says, So that by his death we, he might destroy him who holds the power of death. That is the devil. John makes it clear in his letter, 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of of the devil. Satan was expecting Jesus to say, oh, I'm finished. I'm done. I've done my best. I can't do anything more. Jesus didn't say, I'm finished. He said, it is finished. The work has been completed. Satan has been defeated. No one can ever come to you. Satan can never come to you and say, you're a sinner. And because of your sin, you can't get into God's heaven. Because you can say, Titeleste, it is finished. Yes, I am a sinner. But Jesus paid the full price. And now I stand by his grace as righteous. Titeleste, it is finished. Satan has been defeated. Number four, salvation was secure. Because everything has been done that needed to be done, we now have access to the Father. Theologians sometimes refer to this as the finished work of Jesus. Charles Spurgeon said it this way, the great cannonade of God's justice has exhausted all its ammunition. There is nothing left to be hurled against a child of God. End of quote. The justice of God has been satisfied. Your sins have been paid in full so that you now, not just the high priest, you now can access the presence of God. Not because you're righteous, not because you come to church every Sunday, but because Jesus upon the cross took away your sins. Jesus on the cross paid the penalty. Jesus on the cross 
took the wrath of God that was due you and I upon himself. And when we put our faith in Jesus as our substitute, trusting in his finished work, there are a number of things that take place. Let me just mention three of them. There are many more, but these are three. One, regeneration takes place. We're given a new life. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says this, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Secondly, justification takes place. You are declared righteous in spite of your sinfulness. Romans 5.1 says this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You have been made right with God. God has given you the righteousness of Jesus. Again, not because of anything you've done, but because of his grace and mercy and Jesus' finished work on the cross. Romans 8.1 says, There is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You have been made right with God. Again, not because of anything you and I do, but because titeleste, it is finished. Second Corinthians 5 says this, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. God's desire all along has been what? We who were made in the image of God might glorify Him in all that we do. And so for us to complete what God desires for us, being made in His image to glorify Him, He takes away our sins, He declares us righteous, He fills us with His Spirit so that we might glorify Him. Fourthly, thirdly rather, adoption. We've been brought into God's family, never to be cast out. Romans 8 says this, For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received a spirit of sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By him, by Jesus, by Titila, by his finished work. And the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. You don't become a child of God because you come to church. You become a child of God because you're adopted by the Father because you trust in the work of His Son. So what does this all matter? Let me give you three principles. One, since Jesus paid it all, there's nothing more that needs to be done. Salvation is not a do-it-yourself kind of project. Nowadays, if you want to do a project around home, you, you do, I was about to say, you go to the bookstore and you find how to do it books, and you do it, but you don't go to the bookstore anymore. You turn on YouTube. You want to know how to replace a graphic card and computer? Type it into YouTube and they'll show you a video. Anna, our Chinese granddaughter, Wanted to know how to build a mousetrap car. What does she do? Goes on to YouTube. She showed it to me last night. And last night we finished the, the uh, uh, mousetrap uh, car. Because YouTube showed us how to do it. Salvation is not a do-it-yourself kind of project. It's not a 50-50 arrangement where you do 50% and God does 50%. Jesus has done it all so that you don't have to do anything. Some of us try to clean up ourselves to make ourselves presentable to God, but we forget Isaiah 64. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. It's not just our acts, all of our righteous acts, <laughs> all of the things that we want to do to be, make ourselves religious 
or as filthy. I remember growing up as a Roman Catholic boy, and I remember being in the sixth and seventh grade um, and, and thinking I want to become a priest someday, and I want to get close to God and serve God, and I wasn't holy enough, and th therefore I did all the stations of the cross at least once a day for I don't know how long. And I told my mom, can I go, and, and, can I go to early Mass? So we'd get up at 4.30 in the morning, and we'd, we'd be at Mass at 5 o'clock, and I'd go to Mass every single day. And I came to the age where I could serve as an altar boy, and I went into the convent and served Mass for all the nuns at 5 a.m. in the morning because I thought somehow my righteous acts, all the good things, somehow make me more acceptable to God. I'd never read Isaiah 64. All our righteous acts are like filthy rags. There's nothing you can do religiously to make yourself acceptable by God. And so one of the things I need to say to you is stop performing. Stop preforming. Your acceptance is not based on anything you do, but what God has already done. Now, I know this, for most of you, is old news. But I would suggest to you that sometimes secretly, secretly, we believe there is something we must do. I don't know if it's our culture. I don't know if it's our... Protestant religious upbringing, but we sometimes think we must do things. So let me put it in the way of a math equation. Jesus plus nothing equal everything. That formula is true. Why? Titeleste. Jesus did it all. It is finished. Secondly, since Jesus Christ paid in full, the only thing you can do is accept it or reject it. It's your decision of what you do. John 6 has this wonderful verse. If you feel like you need to do something, then this is what God does call you to do. The work of God is this, to believe in the one who sent him. If you want some work to do, if you feel like somehow in the American way of things you have to do something, this is what you need to do. Believe in him. Trust him. And trust only him. Thirdly, if you have a relationship with God, if you've trusted the Lord, if you're saved, you're eternally secure. If you are genuinely a child of God, you can't lose that relationship. Someone once wrote a book called Stop Asking Jesus Into Your Heart. And the title of the book makes a great point. Once you've asked Jesus into your heart, he's in your heart. He's there forever. I get into a relationship with God by grace. Do you think that I stay in a relationship because I work. I get into the relationship by grace, and I stay in the relationship by grace. I get into the relationship by the work done. I stay in the relationship by the work done, not by my doing. And so this morning, can you hear the cry from the cross, Titeleste, it is finished. The divine demands of holiness and justice have been met in the divine done. And so are you ready to embrace the gospel of done, the gospel of grace? Let me conclude this morning by just this short story. A young man came up to his pastor one day and asked, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to have a relationship with God? And the pastor, in a playful kind of spirit, said this, Oh, I'm sorry. It's too late. The man says, What do you mean it's too late? Are you kidding me? There's nothing I can do? The preacher shook his head and said, Nah, it's too late. I'm sorry. It's already been done. 
The only thing you need to do is trust in the work that has been done. And so this morning, the word of Scripture to us is titeleste. It is finished. Will you trust in the finished work of Christ for you? For it is done. Let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks this morning for your word. And Father, for most of us, we've grown up in the church most of our lives, and somehow the culture of the church makes us feel that we ought to do things in order to be saved. And yet, your word so clearly teaches us that there is, there is nothing we can do. That even our righteous acts are filthy. And that Jesus, your own son, whom you sent, has paid the price, has completed the work, has done all that there needs to be done. And so this morning, Father, help us to trust in Jesus, who has paid the penalty for our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>